a reporter who happened to be at Newsday in the late 1960s. Yes, all right, for the sake of it. He was covering this guy, Robert Moses, watching all these roads being built and wondering how does this unelected guy get the power to change the landscape and to make such a huge impact on all of our lives? Interesting question. But he did more than ask the questions. He went after the answers and it took him years. Uh, not the least because Robert Moses wasn't interested in having him get the answers, but <clears throat> he had to quit his job to do it. But the result was the definitive book on the accumulation and use of political power in cities, the power broker. And it's being taught in colleges everywhere. He then wanted to understand political power on the national scene. And a certain Senate majority leader became his subject. And he's still writing the fifth and final volume of the years of Lyndon Johnson. Along the way, he has won two Pulitzer Prizes and virtually every major book award this country has to offer. And he's been presented with a National Humanities Medal by President Obama. Not bad, not bad. Today, it is our great pleasure to have Robert Caro here with us. Well, I was saying with such a nice introduction that I'm reminded of what Lyndon Johnson used to say. When he got an especially nice introduction, he used to say that he wished his parents were alive to hear it because his father would have loved it and his mother would have believed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's he didn't say, but I wish he knows it. Coming here today to the saloon is, is really a special moment for me and I have the whole team of research on all my books. Because when I was a reporter on Newsday in 1964, I won the Silurian's Award for Public, for, for public Service. Uh, that was the first award we had ever won. Newsday didn't get many awards in those days, so they actually sent us to the awards dinner in a helicopter. <laughs> And I don't know, I, it, was, it was one of the great days of our life. And so if you think about how long ago 1964 was, you sometimes have moments when you feel your life has come in sort of a circle. And that's sort of what uh, I feel today. And I'm, re I'm really happy to be here. Uh, people are always asking me, uh, what's the difference between writing as a reporter and writing books? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And then afterwards you can ask me questions about anything that you want. Uh, but in order to talk about the difference between being a reporter and writing books, I have to go back to how I became an investigative reporter in the first place. Because it explains some stuff. I became one by complete accident. I was a young reporter, uh, I had never worked, I only previously worked there after college on a newspaper called the New Brunswick Daily Home News and Sunday Times, the voice of the Raritan Valley. And we didn't get too much out of there. So I really didn't have a good idea of what I was doing when I got hired, when I got hired by Newsday. Heiner and I were living near New Brunswick, then, a place called Edison. And I said, to, at those days, the newspaper guild had a provision that when you were hired for the first six months you were on probation and you could be basically fired at any time without cause. They could just let you go. And I said, to him, I don't think I'm going to make this, so let's not move. So we're going to be driving back and forth between Garden City where the Newsday offices were and uh, Edison every day. When the following thing happened, uh, well, first let me get it. We had a... Uh, I felt that I didn't have enough experience to work there, but I also felt that it wasn't this friendly, welcoming atmosphere. And the reason was, Newsday had this managing editor from the days of the 1920s, from the front page days. His name, which unfortunately people don't remember anymore, is Alan Hathaway. When Alicia Patterson founded Newsday, 
She was the daughter of Joseph Neville Patterson of the newspaper wars of Chicago in the 1920s. And he had had a city, uh, he had had a city editor uh, named Alan Hatton. And when Alicia started uh, Newsday, she brought Alan Moon to be the managing editor. And he was really something out of a, of the old, old age of journalism. He was one of these guys with big shoulders and a big stomach, but it was a hard stomach, not a soft one. He used to wear outfits, I remember he had a black shirt with a yellow tie, he had a brown shirt with a white tie. His head, he had a big, sort of massive head, completely bald, except, I guess, what you call a monk's tonsure around it. And it was very red, because Alan drank a lot. <laughs> and, as Nor as, and he didn't want I, anyone from the Ivy League. I went to Princeton. And he didn't want anyone from the Ivy League working at Newsday. And I was either the first or one of the very first people from the Ivy League that was hired there. I was hired there as sort of a joke on him. I later found out by the guy, Bill McElwain, who was, well, Alan was on vacation. And Alan was furious when, when he came back. And he wouldn't talk to me. And my desk was right outside his office. He had this glassed-in office, the only glassed-in office in the city room in the corner. My desk was right next to him. And every morning, this figure, fierce figure, would come walking by. And I'd look up, hoping he'd say something to me, and he wouldn't talk to me. But the following thing happened, the accident I'm talking about. The note Newsday didn't publish on uh, Sunday. So the low man on the totem pole in the city room, and I was definitely the low man on the totem pole, worked Saturday afternoon. And the re because if something happened, he just wrote a memo on it for the real reporters to write the story Sunday night for the, Monday, for the Monday paper. So I was all alone in the city room one Saturday, and it was the day of the Newsday picnic. And remember, this was before cell phones. So everyone from Newsday was on the beach at Fire Island when suddenly there was a call from an official of the Federal Aviation Administration. Newsday then was quite a crusading paper. And the thing, its, its cause at the moment was the Air Force was giving up Mitchell Field in the middle of Nassau County. I think it was 1,800 of the most valuable agents in, in the county. And the Federal Aviation Agency wanted to turn, make it a private airport so that commercial jets, commercial planes from the companies there could use it. Newsday wanted to create a, commu a community college to be created there, land hospital facilities to give Hofstra more acreage for public uses. And they were fine out of various reasons why the FAA wanted to do uh, the opposite. And I, the phone rang, and it was an official of the Federal Aviation Administration who said, I'm down at, it was then Idlewild Airport, it wasn't yet Kennedy Airport. He said, I'm down at our headquarters at Idlewild, and if you will send somebody down, I know what files you want to look at, and you can, and there's nobody here but me, and you can look at them this afternoon. So I frantically tried to call some editor to get our great investigative reporter, Bob Green, or at least someone on the investigative team to go down. And I couldn't reach anybody because everybody was on the beach at Fire Island. And I finally got somebody, lower ranking editor, who said, well, you'll have to go yourself. I had never done anything like this before. And I went down to the FAA, and I remember I worked there the whole day and the whole night, wrote this long memo on where I found and thought. And then I went home. I was off Monday. So I was home in Edison, and the phone rings, and it's Alan Hathaway's secretary, June Blum. And she says, Alan wants to see you right now. I said, well, I'm in New Jersey. She said, well, get here as fast as you can. And I said to Ina, you see, I was right. Thank God we didn't move. I'm about to be fired. <laughs> and I drove in, believing that all the way. I still remember walking into the newsroom and June Blum, the secretary, going like this to come over to Alan's office. And I walked, I imagine slowly, as in my memory, over there. And as I get to the door of his office, I see this huge red head bending over, reading something very intensely.
and he doesn't look up for a while, and then he sort of waves me to a chair, but he stays there reading this thing. And, he lo I, and I see, it's my memo that he's reading. And he looks up after a while and he says, I didn't know someone from Princeton could do digging like this. From now on, you do it, get investigator work. Well, in moments like this, I have this great savoir faire. And with my savoir faire, I said, but I don't know anything about investigator work. <laughs> and he said to me, don't assume a damn thing. Just turn every page. He also said, I'll put you next to Bob Green. I don't know how many of you people here knew Bob Green. He was a great investigative reporter, but he weighed north of 300 pounds, I believe. And we had little tin desks in the office. So when we were both sitting at our desks, he was sitting at half my desk at the same time. <laughs> but I learned an awful lot uh, from him, and I walked, but I never forgot what Alan said to me, turn every page. And um, when I started doing books, I decided to do the same thing. So when I got to the Lyndon Johnson books, that presented quite a problem. I don't know how many of you have been to the Lyndon Johnson library in Austin. But when you go in, there's a broad, tall marble staircase. And at the top of it, or is a glass wall, and behind it are four floors of what looks like red boxes, well, they are red boxes, but they're red buckram boxes with a seal in 24 karat gold on each one. There's the president, that's the presidential papers, and there's the presidential papers of Lyndon Johnson. And they go back, well, the library says the last time they released the figure, they said they have 44 million documents. Uh, so you're not going to be able to turn every page, or even a big fraction of it. But the first volume was going to be largely on Lyndon Johnson's congressional career. And there you had a manageable amount of boxes. It was a large amount of boxes, but uh, several hundred. But you really said, Einer and I can do this. I think I should ask Einer to stand up. She's the only person who's done research on my book. So Einer and I would, were sitting there basically turning every page. And the following thing happened because of that. There was a change, a mystery in Lyndon Johnson's life, a change that no one had written about or accounted for. He's elected to Congress in 1937 at the age of 28. So he's a junior congressman with no, with no power at all. In the days when the House was governed even more strictly than today, by seniority. And Johnson, so you can see this, that he has no power, no influence in his papers, because when he's writing letters to committee chairman or other powerful congressmen, the tone of the letters is, dear sir, can I have a few minutes of your time? And this is true up until a certain month, and the month is October 1940, the month before election day, November 3rd, 1940. In November, after the election, Suddenly, the tone of the letters is different. It's the committee chairman and the powerful uh, Democrats writing to Lyndon Johnson, to this junior congressman, can I have a few minutes of your time? So what happened during that month? So during that time, I had become friends during my interviews with a man, some of you may remember the name, Thomas Tommy the Cork, Cork who was Roosevelt's great fundraiser and fixer. And we had become real friends. He used to call me kid. So I said to him, what happened in October 1940? And Corcoran said to me, I said, money, kid, money. He said, but you're never going to be able to write about that kid. And I said, why? He said, because you're never going to find anything in writing. Lyndon never wrote anything down. And for several years, I believed that. I knew what he was talking about. You know, Lyndon Johnson was a political genius. Genius means some, some very specific things. And one of them means that you see something that nobody has seen before. And this junior congressman, Lyndon Johnson, saw something that no one had seen before, that he and he alone, there was one thing that he and he alone possessed that no other congressman possessed. He was friends with two groups of people. 
the Texas oil men who needed the oil depletion allowance and who needed hundreds of oil-related favors and legislation, actually, and the big contractors, namely Herman Brown of Brown and Root. They needed stuff from the federal government, uh, legislation, contracts, and they were willing to pay in the form of campaign contributions to get it. Johnson was also friends, I should say, and they are conservative is not out of their reaction, they are anti-Semitic, they are anti-black, anti-Catholic. They are the Texas, what was known as the Texas regulars, the most reactionary force in America. But Johnson knows them, and he knows they need this from government and are willing to pay for it. And he also knows the Northeast, well, all the North, Northern Congress, the Northern Liberal Congressmen, who need, they're liberals, but they need campaign money. And in a flash of genius, he realizes that if he can make himself the conduit, the only conduit, if all the money from Texas goes through him, and you have, if you want this money, you have to come to him, he will have political power. And he, does, he persuades Herman Brown to put the word out, well, he didn't have to put the word out, he ordered, Brown and Rule ordered in Texas. He put the word out to only give through Lyndon Johnson. Now, I knew that, but for about a couple of years, I thought Corcoran was right. I never was going to be able to prove this. I didn't find anything in writing. But we were trying to turn every page. And that meant even going into four boxes where the file folders were labeled and the box was labeled general unarranged. I mean, you, really, you really don't feel like wasting your time on this. But as I'm going through these boxes, and there was another set of boxes, four other boxes called something called selected names. Uh, as we're going through one of the one of the selected name boxes, suddenly, and I can still see it, turning, suddenly there is a telegram, a yellow telegram sheet from George Brown to Lyndon Johnson in October 1940. Lyndon, the checks are on the way. And I, and I noted down in the corner of that is the amount and six people gave $5,000, which was actually the most money that the Congressional uh, Democratic Congressional Campaign had ever been given. And in the other set of boxes, and you're just sitting there turning pages that have nothing to do, you're not even taking notes at, on most of the stuff, and it has nothing to do with anything. Suddenly, there is in one of these boxes one, a, a document that really struck me. It was four type pages. I've always believed that John Connolly, who was the, later the uh, Treasury Secretary, and at that time he was Lyndon Johnson's administrative assistant. I always believed that John Connolly was the guy who typed it, but it could have been either Connolly or Walter Jenkins, Johnson's or other assistant. There are three type columns. There are four sheets of paper. On each one, there are three type columns. The left-hand column is the name of a congressman who's asking for money. In the cent next to it is a column with a little message why they need the money. Lyndon, one more out round of ads and I can beat this guy. Lyndon, we need money for poll watches. Lyndon, they're trying to steal. We need more, we need more watches in District 3. And then the third column is the amount they're asking for. And the amount they're asking for is so small that in today's terms, it's um, laughable. It's $1,000 or $1,500 or $500. But there's a fourth column on that page. It's the left-hand margin. And in that margin, next to each name, is handwriting, Lyndon Johnson's handwriting. So for some, he writes, OK. That means he's giving the amount that they ask for. And some, if he's giving only part of the amount, it will be OK 1,000, or OK 1,500, or OK 500. But next to some of them, this young congressman writes, no. And next to other ones, he writes, no out. So I asked 
John Connolly, what does no out mean? What did no out mean? And Connolly said that meant he was never getting money from Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson never forgot. So you were able to see exactly how, why Lyndon Johnson got this power. And you know, you say today, it's sort of a cliche, you read academic textbooks on politics, people writ textbooks written by academics rather than journalists, rather than by, by reporters. Over and over again, there's no way of proving the, the, the uh, effect of economic forces on the political forces. I'm showing exactly how money, exactly what money did uh, to influence our democracy. But of course, that's not true in this case anymore. We were able, I was able to write exactly how Lyndon Johnson did it how economic forces impacted political forces and bent the bias of democracy off its uh, straight, what's supposed to be a straight course. And I did it by remembering what Alan had told me, the sentence that he told me, turn every page so many years before. So people are always asking me, you know, what's the difference between writing as a reporter and writing books? And the truth is, is in many ways, there's no difference at all. They're both a search for the truth. Of course, there is no truth. You're never going to find a truth. But what there is is an awful lot of objective facts. The more facts that you get, the closer you come to whatever truth there is. And the way to come close to whatever truth there is is basically to do everything that's implied in the phrase, turn every page. So that's about all that I wanted to say today, and uh, I'll be glad to take questions on Lyndon Johnson or Robert Moses. When you were talking about Brown and that whole story, it reminded me of the opening pages of the first volume, Path on Power, when he's being approached about being running for office. Yes. And he says, I can't do it. It would kill me politically. Yes. And the, 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 I wish you'd share that with us as, as an example of his foresight genius. And the other question, and one we've talked about time over the years, there were some people who loved Lyndon Johnson, not that many perhaps, but some. Did Lyndon Johnson ever love anybody? Well, that's, that's two questions. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Let me do the easier one first. The scene, I'm so glad you mentioned that because people don't mention that scene. And to me, it's one of the most revealing scenes in Lyndon Johnson's whole life. What happens is Lyndon Johnson is very, those of you who have read the books, and for those who haven't the test this Tuesday, <laughs> Lyndon Johnson was terribly poor, terribly poor. And when he gets to Washington, he feels terribly poor. And he's always talking about needing money, that he has less than $1,000 in, in the bank, he used to say. He doesn't want his father wound up completely broke uh, as a bus inspector in Texas. They had no money. They lost the Johnson Ranch. So Johnson's entire boyhood was colored by the fact that they lost the ranch, had to move to a town in Johnson City, and every month they couldn't pay the mortgage. They were worried about paying the mortgage. Usually the father's brothers paid the mortgage for them. So money was this great constant in his life. And that's noticed by a number of the big oil men in Texas who are personally fond of him. One is Sid Richardson, who is, uh, if I remember this scene, is Sid Richardson, the oil man, yet it's been a long time since I wrote this, who's Sid Richardson, a man of unbelievable wealth. And the other is a man named Charles Marsh, who is not only an oil man, but he was the publisher of the newspaper that might, meant the most to Lyndon Johnson, um, the Austin American Statesman. And they take him down to a vacation on the Greenbrier Hotel, and they're laying on a blanket there. And they make him this offer. Sid Richardson offers him basically a partnership 
that he won't have to pay for in advance, that he can pay for out of profits on one of his big oil fields. That will make Johnson rich, and Johnson knows it. But he does not accept immediately. He doesn't say, oh, thank you. He says, I'm going to have to think about that. And the next day, he tells the two of them, I've decided not to take it because that would make me an oil man. And being an oil man would kill me politically. So this year, I forget the year. It's been so long since I wrote it. Let's say it's about 1941, 42. So Lyndon Johnson is something like 32, 33, maybe 34 years old. They say they can't figure out. George Brown said this, this to me when I finally got him to talk to him. Where I, he said, we couldn't understand that. We all thought we understood Lyndon. He was all talking about wanting to be a senator one day. Well, a senator is a senator from Texas. Being an oil man wouldn't hurt you there, you know? So why would only then did they begin to glimpse what he wanted, what he really wanted, which was, of course, the presidency, and the fact that he was willing to sacrifice this offer in order, in order to get it. Your other question is, who did he love? Well, I think he loved, well, you don't, I don't know the answer. That's not as easy to document. <laughs> of course, the, the, well, he didn't, well, that's a very good, Lyndon Johnson didn't have any friends, you know? Nobody was a friend. I mean, uh, you were close to him as long as he could use you. You know, I quote in one, because uh, he said it, Nathaniel Hawthorne said it much better than me. He said, uh, he, was, he was writing about Andrew Jackson, and he said to Jackson, every man is a tool, and the, sh the smarter the man, the sharper the tool. And that's you really feel, is, and you see at each stage of his life, he uses people, he's close to people, he invites them over. And when he doesn't need them anymore, they never see him again. In his romantic life, of course, there's, there's a different story. There's one woman, uh, Alice Glass. Uh, the story of that is in the first book, who is very special to him. That's an amazing story, uh, really. Um, she is married to Charles Marsh, this man I mentioned before was on the blanket. So he's the guy who, most important to Lyndon Johnson, he's the publisher of the only major daily in his district, the Austin American Statesman. She's a girl from this small town in Texas, Marlin, who's become known as one of the most beautiful women. The, the famous society photographer of the 1930s was a guy named Arnold Genthin, who called her the most beautiful woman in America. She is beautiful, and, uh, but more than that, she has a political ability. Uh, there are a number of times, in, so she starts inviting the young congressman down to her great, it's a, this, the Marsh has bought her this great estate. Actually, he bought her this great piece of land in Virginia, in the Hunt country, and then she wanted a, a house just like this famous house in England called Longley. So he basically brought Longley over stone by stone and recreated it there. Um, and she was a hostess. She, uh, she was a great horseback rider. She led the, whatever, the Culpeper Hunt, I think it was called. But she was also one of the few people in his life that Lyndon Johnson ever took advice for. We know, and her advice was the advice that he listened to. How do we know that? Because he's now, it's 1942, he's gone to the Pacific, he's in Australia. While he's there, the senior senator from Texas, a guy named Mara Shepard, dies, and he has to decide, it's 1942, is he going to run again for his House seat, or is he going to run for the Senate? Roosevelt, who of course, those of you, Roosevelt, who really had very a great fondness for Lyndon Johnson, has said to him when he leaves, if you have any problems out there, call the White House, meaning you can call me. But Johnson, they're all, you're only allowed one call when you're a soldier in Australia uh, 
in the war. He doesn't make that call to the White House. He makes the call to Alice Glass. How do we know that? Because I found in the Johnson papers the telegram that she sends him back telling what he asked her and what her answer is. And her telegram says everyone else, which basically means the White House, thinks you should run for senator. I think you should run for the House. And he runs for the House. And there are times in his life when she intervenes to save him. There's a dinner party at Longley before the, so Herman, well, this is why my books take so long. I have to give you a little, <laughs> little background here. Uh, so Herman Brown is his financier of his campaigns. But there comes a time in 1941 before the war breaks out, if I have that date right, I don't, it's been a long time since I wrote it, when they're really on a collision course because Lyndon Johnson wants to build low-income housing in Austin. And the low-income housing would be in this Mexican area which of real hovels, but Herman Brown owns all the houses that all these Mexicans are uh, renting from him, and it's very profitable to him. And he is just furious at Johnson's uh, plan and isn't giving in and is really is on the verge of an irreparable split. At the same time, Johnson is obtaining federal authorization for the, a dam up in the hill country, and Herman Brown hasn't gotten enough money for it yet. And they really are not speaking to it. This is, this is a crucial moment. If he loses Brown's backing, he's just going to, he's just going to be like another congressman. And at the dinner table, Alice basically says, what's going on here? They each tell her, and in an instant, without even thinking about it, she says, well, give Herman the dam and Lyndon the housing. And they both agree to that, and his career is safe. So she's quite an unusual woman. Um, one of the most, one of the times I didn't know what question to ask was Lady Bird found out, well, what, found, what happened was, as I said, she's a small town girl from Marlin. So her sister, I didn't really know much about her, but her, Alice's sister and her best friend came to uh, Einer and I and, and said, you know, we know you're going to find out about Alice, um, and we don't want her portrayed as some sort of bimbo. So we we want to tell you about her. And um, there comes a time when he's very well may have divorced Lady Bird, except really, I forget exactly what I say in the book. Gary seems to know the books better than I remember. I think Sam Rayburn basically says that that will be the end of your career. But I'm not sure, I, but whatever reason, he decides, he draws back from that. So I. Alice is a very important figure. I don't write very much about Lyndon Johnson's many affairs because they don't have any much significance uh, in his life. Alice Glass is a big figure in his life, is important. I knew I was going to have to write about her. So since she was from this little town in Mar called Marlin, which is in the middle of nowhere, you go to Waco and turn right and drive 180 <laughs> miles. I mean, there, there isn't any other reason you'd be going to Marlin, you know? Uh, I had made it, we had been there so many times that we had made a friend there, a guy named Frank Oldsworth, Pasha Oldsworth, and we were asking all her girlhood friends, you know, tell us about Alice, that sort of thing. And one day, uh, he said, Bird knows you're going to Marlin. You know, they, in Texas, they call Lady Bird, Bird. So I said, well, that's, there's nothing I can do about that. So at that time, Lady Bird was talking to me, and the way it was working was every Saturday she'd spend the whole day with me. And she'd take out her desk calendar and her diary, which she had already started uh, keeping, and go through the desk calendar. So oh, we had dinner with Sam Rayburn and Homer Thornburger. I remember what they talked about. She was wonderful to me. Out of nowhere, so but this one day, her se sorry, I forgot, her secretary comes in over to my desk in the reading room and says, Mrs. Johnson would like to see you out at the ranch instead of at her office this Saturday. So I said, fine. And the morning was just an ordinary interview like I've described to you. Then came lunch. So 
It was a long table, and Lady Bird was sitting where just this gentleman is. And I'm sitting here with my pad here, and out of nowhere, she suddenly, she some, so, just says, you know, I'd like to tell you about Alice Glass. And I, and she, she, what she said is in the book, of course. She said she was this great influence in Lyndon's life. Everything she taught Lyndon, he never forgot. And, and that went down, like, when he came, he was this gangly, young, unsophisticated congressman, and his uh, wrists stuck out, he had very long arms, and his wrists stuck out of his sleeves, so she said, always wear shirts with cufflinks, you'll look better that way. She told him to wear Countess Mara ties, so for the rest of his life, the only ties he would wear are Countess Mara ties. Uh, and, and she talked about how she, Lady Bird, I think this said she was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. That's the only interview where I didn't ask any questions. I was too embarrassed. I mean, I remember sitting there writing down what she said and not looking. I didn't want to look up at her. You know? so, so that's that that's, stands out from the rest Bob, of the life. Bob, that's the longest answer to a question we ever received, but the best one. <laughs> Um, yes. I'm just, could you tell us a, a little bit um, about your relationship with Ina and the way the two of you uh, work together and how that partnership has evolved in terms of research and writing? Sure. But that's another long answer. <laughs> well, um, it actually started when I was working on the power broker. We were... Uh, quite broke. I had quit news. I wasn't able to quit Newsday because we had no savings. So I had the world's, what we used to call, I know and I, the world's smallest contract, which was $5,000 of which they had given us $2,500. But I really, we didn't have any savings. So I couldn't quit. I finally got a, a grant for a year. I thought I'd be done in a year. Actually, I told her I'd be done in nine months. And, um, but at the end of that time, there was no money again, and we were really out of money. And I, I came home one day, and Ina said, we sold the house today. And she loved that house. And um, it was before the real estate boom, so we cleared only $25,000 on it. But that was enough for another year. And while we were working on the power broker, I got hurt, as it happens. And for quite a long time, about a year, I couldn't get out of bed. So Ina had to learn to be an investigative reporter, which was really fun, because I, I knew that, like, I was investigating how Robert Moses had gotten the Republican machine to agree to do Jones Beach out there. And it was largely by telling them what, what the route of the Meadowbrook Parkway and the Wantua Parkway were going to be in advance so they could buy up the land. And I needed to prove that. So I tell Ina, go down to the Mineola courthouse, and there's a payphone outside the swinging doors. Call me. And she called me, and I'd say, uh, now go through the doors, and your second corridor on your right is the land deeds. And then, the, so she did a lot of great investigative reporting. But the thing that she did that was probably the most valuable, it's hard to say because she did so many things. You know, Ina's the whole... I mean, other writers, you know, they have teams of historians. If you look at the acknowledgments and teams of researchers, there's only one name in the back of my book in that capacity because no one, I've never trusted anyone but Ina to do research. So she's really the whole team of researchers. But one of the great things she did, and then I'm going to stop so the answer doesn't get even longer, was when we moved to the Hill Country, the women of the Hill Country were very suspicious of anyone from the city. And they were also afraid of Lyndon Johnson. And nobody was telling me anything. And um, I needed them to tell me things. So we, w we had rented a house, and we lived up in the Hill Country for most of three years. So Ina said, well, I'll make fig preserves. That was a sign of friendship when you brought jam to their houses. We had fig trees on our property, so I learned how to make fig preserves, and she went and made friends with these women. And when we discovered, well, I can't go into all that, uh, 
how Lyndon Johnson changed their lives by bringing electricity to the hill country, which is one of the great, great things that he did, and how pathetic their lives were before, Ina would go back and get them to tell her things that I never could. I always thought that was something that very few people could have achieved. But that's enough about her. <laughs> <laughs> So the point of that story is to be a successful writer, sleep with your researchers. <laughs> In the age of emails uh, and using the computer, uh, you're not going to be able to find documents. So how is the, the writing of biography and history going to change? Uh, well, it's, go it's going to change a, lo a lot. Um, I don't, you know, Things have changed before, um, like long distance, you know, used to be very expensive. So up till the year 19, well, I forget the year, I think it was 1941, uh, Johnson had John Connolly as his district man, and Connolly's job was to go to the 10 court, county courthouses in his district and write Lyndon Johnson a report on what everyone was saying. Then all of a sudden, long distance comes in and you see these notes. And you don't see any more letters. You see Johnson saying, Connolly, call me, call me at 10 o'clock tonight. So that made things harder. I, I believe there, there will be, I, but I don't know what the answer is. It's going to make things much harder. Uh, but I, I think there will be ways of finding things out. I just don't know what they are. Mr. Carroll, I'm wondering if you could share this, kind of your process, because The Power Broker, I mean, such a long book, it took me the better part of a year to get through it, even though I was mesmerized by it. I'm thinking about all the stuff that you maybe had to edit out. Did you write, went along? I'm Did sorry? you accumulate information and then write, or would you accumulate a whole bunch information and then finally write the final draft. I'm just curious how you kept it all, because I'm imagining you buried in paper. And of course, that wouldn't happen today, because, you know, it's all email now. Well, I was buried in paper, you know, when you finished. So I always, I tried to do, but of course, this isn't uh, baloney, because it never happened. I try to do all the research before I start writing. Uh, so with The Power Broker, I had never read, written a book. And I had done all this research. and I had, So I really didn't know what to do. It was a very bad time. I couldn't figure out what to do uh, with the book. Uh, what happened with The Power Broker was the following thing. Um, while I was stuck like this, and I, and I was stuck, and no one was interested in the book. You know, my, my first editor, I, I changed publishing house. My first publishing house, the editor just kept telling me when he was refusing me to give me the other $2,500. You know, <laughs> nobody's going to read a book on Robert Moses. You know, you have to be prepared for a very small print. So no one cared about the book. And here I was with this <laughs> tremendous mass of material. I didn't know how to organize it. When the following thing happened, um, he wasn't talking to me, of course, Moses. I, but I was going, he was, I was going to every speech that he gave. And he gave this speech out in Flushing Meadow Park. I was sitting in the back row where he basically, the idea of the spe speech, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, the idea of the speech was, why weren't people more grateful to him? you know, for everything he had done. He said, someday, oh, he was dedicating an exedra, that's a bridge for, a bench for reflection that had been donated by the uh, Catholic Arch Archdiocese. He said, he said, someday we'll sit on this bench and reflect on the ingratitude of man, you know. <laughs> and in front of him, there was this row of these what they called the Moses men. These, and they, you saw all these heads going like this. You know, and he said, why weren't they grateful? And suddenly I said, that's the idea of the book. He did so much. Why aren't people grateful? And I suddenly saw the book, you know, at the entire book, just I, in, in an instant. And uh, so for that book, I, w I just went back and outlined it. Since that time, 
It's been very different. I learned a different thing. I mean, believe me, I don't recommend this. I'm, this is not, this is just desperation on my part. I always have so much material that I try and boil it down to a very short thing. One paragraph or two paragraphs, and once it was three paragraphs. I say, I must make myself think through the whole book. What is this book about that you can say in a couple of sentences? Uh, it takes, if you saw me, you'd see that's a very, you know, I make this all sound like I know what I'm doing, but I, I, <laughs> that's not the way it is. And it's a very bad, each time you think you're never going to be able to get these paragraphs. And uh, you sit there, you know, people ask me how long this takes. It can take <laughs> weeks, you know, you say, you type it out. You know, that's not it. But if you can, what, for me, because my books have such long digressions, you know, on a biography of Richard Russell or a history of the populists or whatever, if you can manage to do that, so then you can tack up on your board what this book is about, then when you go off on a long digression, it's really much, much easier for me to see how that digression and write it so it comes back to the main theme. Anyway, that's the way I've been doing it. I read the first volume, a volume of the book and you, you were already well into your second and maybe your third volume. Uh, and I said to myself or my wife or somebody, he really doesn't like this fellow. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he's spending a good part of his life writing books about a guy that he really dislikes, doesn't have much respect for, and I wonder if you'd comment on that. Yeah, well, I don't think like or dislike has much application to the way I feel about Lyndon Johnson, because, you know, my, I think my books are about power, and to why I'm just awed by him, by the way he uses power. People say I changed my point of view because the third and fourth volume are more, date, more uh, favorable to him than the first or second volume. But I didn't change my point of view. It's the same guy. The only thing that happened is in the first and second volume, he's desperate to get power. He'll do any, almost anything. I don't mean assassination. He'll do almost anything to get power. So that's what those books are about, getting power. And it's very unpleasant. Does he steal the election? He steals the election. Does he do these other things I talk about? He does them all. He basically doesn't do very much. He does only this one wonderful thing, electricity, which I give, give him credit. So those are very unpleasant books to write. But you see, what I believe is, if I can, while Lord, Lord Acton says, and we all know the quote, you know, power, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts completely. I haven't found that that's true. I found that power can, often, can also cleanse, that in cases like Al Smith or Sam Rayburn, when they get power, you see what they want to do all along. So what I've come to believe is always true is not Lord Acton's quote, that all power corrupts, but that power reveals. When a guy gets power, you finally see what he wanted to. When he gets enough power to do what he wants, then you see what he wanted to do all along. And if what he wanted to do all along is wonderful, like the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the education bills, Medicare, Head Start, the War on Poverty, if what he wants to do is wonderful, then the book is a lot, has a, has a different tone. But it's the same guy uh, all the way through. I wouldn't say I like or dislike him. I would say I'm absolutely in awe by the way he gets things done. Yes, sir. Uh, you had to do a lot of investigative stuff yes. side, uh, getting around Robert Moses. Yes. Do you think if he had cooperated, the book would have been the book that it, that it eventually became? Dealing with Robert Moses really just reinforced, you know, when you, so he didn't see me, you know, when he started, he said this, you know, no one had ever succeeded in doing a biography of Robert Moses. Many writers, including some very famous ones, had started with a biography. None had ever written a biography. Uh, I think he basically said to them what he said to me, I'll never speak to you. 
My family will never speak to you. My friends will never speak to you. And then he had this one phrase, I can't re ever remember the quite, but the gist of it was nobody have, who ever wants a contract from the city or state <laughs> will ever speak to you. <laughs> And in fact, you know, for about two years, nobody spoke to me. And um, so I was doing the book around him. Then suddenly, I think he realized that finally a book was going to get done, whether he wanted it done or not. So he decided to talk to me, and that was immensely valuable. They were all day talk. They weren't really interviews, all of you who know what interviews. Questions were not really required. I mean, you, you, could, you could raise a topic in the, in the morning, and seven hours later, he'd still be talking about it. But, but it was brilliant, unbelievable talk of a, of a true. He taught me so much about politics in those seven uh, things. You know, he'd say things if you, if I've taught him to do another oh, no. anecdote. So he'd, he forgot nothing. How did he get uh, an appropriation on Jones, and Beach, on Jones' speech? He said, I remember it was eight to seven against us in ways and means. And, but the key vote was Stevens of Cataraugus County. And Stevens had a farm. And he had a mortgage. And the mortgage was held by the First State Bank of Rochester. And the way to get to the First State Bank of Rochester was so and so. So we got Stevens' vote. So he remembered everything taught you a lot about how you get things done. The other side of him was this side of, so he had these huge maps. He had 12 offices. And he had maps about this size of New York and the surrounding areas, Long Island, Westchester. When he'd get excited, so he was already like 78 or 79, he was like a kid. And he'd jump up. He had these pencils, very sharp yellow pencils with erasers. And he'd start drawing on the maps. And he'd say, can't you see? We'll put a highway here. Then we'll put the park here. Now we'll make the housing and go over there. So you sort of felt he was like a guy, like a Picasso. He drew up this plan for this whole area in 1924 and spent the next 44 years filling it in. So I learned a lot uh, from him. But you also, the other side was you saw his incredible, among other things, his incredible racism. I mean, he was the most racist human being I've ever met. Uh, he was, of course, very, uh, he had this horrible gesture of smashing his palm down like this. And I remember he once got a call from someone. And he hung it up in a rage, smashed his palm down and said, they expect me to build playgrounds for that scum floating up from Puerto Rico. That was a real quote of his. Uh, he had quotes about black people that I, I'm not even going to repeat. He didn't want to be known. He, didn't, he wanted not to be Jewish. Um, he said he was Episcopalian. I had to bring that this is the last, and I'll stop. He's, 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 I had to bring this up the question of his religion, because he ran against Herbert Lehman for governor in 1934. It was the first time two Jews had ever run for a governorship in the United States. So there was no way of avoiding the subject of his religion. So when I brought it up, he did this with his hand and said, you really haven't done your homework, young man. I said, well, you know, there is, there is a theory, Commissioner, that if your mother was Jewish, <laughs> And your, two, and your two grandmothers were Jewish. And your four great-grandmothers were Jewish. You know? And he would just say, you haven't done your homework. And so he would, you learned both sides of Robert Moses from getting to talk to him. So thank you all very much. What a lunch. What a talk. And Robert Caro. You are now officially a member of the Silurians. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. We are delighted before.